our, our evening. We have uh, a simple uh, service tonight. We begin with the singing of hymn 598, and then we'll have a couple readings from scripture and a foreword by Martin Luther talking about what, this, what the small catechism was about, why, why it was so important for him to write and how, how valuable it is not only for seventh and eighth graders, but for people throughout their life. Uh, Luther was talking to his son one time, and his son beamed, Dad, I know the whole catechism. And Luther said, do you know? Well, that's wonderful. Me, I have to read it every day. After he read it, and after he was, wrote it, and after he was teaching the students, he also read it himself as, as a good refresher course, as a good study guide. Uh, so it, uh, it's always neat to go to somebody's home when they're 70, 80 years old and look over on the shelf and see an almost completely worn out catechism. <laughs> uh, people can put it to good use. Let's begin with our opening hymn, hymn 598.
We begin this evening with portions of St. Paul's letters to the Romans and first letter to the Corinthians. This speaks of not only the beginning of faith, but faith that lasts till the end. Romans 15, verses 4 through 6. Indeed, whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that through patient endurance and the encourages, encouragement of the scriptures, we would have hope. And may God, the source of patient endurance and encouragement, grant that you agree with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that with one mind, in one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we're, when we're little, uh, we hear in Sunday school, Jesus loves you. And we go, oh, I love him too. We have that emotional attachment and we recognize Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but there is so little that we understand about who he is, what we are, and what he had to do to make us his brother or sister. Uh, and, and that is what the scriptures have as lasting value for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. And this is speaking about one of the primary reasons that we go through catechism class. Uh, as we went through the sacraments, we took a look at the sacrament of baptism, and we noticed that baptism is for adults who have heard the gospel and have come to faith, and for children who are brought by their believing parents to the Lord. But with the Lord's Supper, there are some very important things that Paul tells us about it is possible to receive the Lord's Supper to our spiritual harm. And so we want to make sure that before we commune people, they receive instruction so that they can take God's law and apply it to themselves and know, well, I've done this, I've done that, that is a sin, I need to repent, and that we understand the gospel that Jesus paid for those sins so we can trust, yes, I have forgiveness. This is... This is how Paul explains it to the Corinthian congregation. They were, they were abusing the Lord's Supper. They were treating it like a buffet. And whoever got there first pigged out and the rest went hungry. And he says, this is not good. This is not, this is not a bunch of hamburgers sitting there. This is Christ's body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And so he says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the Lord's body and blood. Instead, let a person examine himself, and after doing so, let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For if anyone eats and drinks in an unworthy way because he does not recognize the Lord's body, he eats and drinks judgment on himself." So Paul says before we are ready to commune and receive it to our blessing, we need to understand what sin is and, and apply God's standard to ourselves. We need to trust in his forgiveness and repent and have that faith to recognize that we have forgiveness. And we need to recognize that this is not just a symbol, but that Jesus, true body and blood are really there because our almighty God who said, when the Father said, let there be light, made it so. Uh, when, when he stood at the grave of his friend Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come out, he did, alive again. Uh, also says, this is my body, this is my blood, and so we understand that it is. We hear from Psalm 25. And the heading for this psalm in the Evangelical Heritage Version is, Teach Me Your Ways. To you, O Lord, I will lift up my soul. In you I have trusted, O oh my God. Do not let me be put to shame. All who hope in you will never be put to shame. Make known to me your ways, O oh Lord.
Teach me your paths. Make me walk in your truth and teach me because you are the God who saves me. In you I hope all day long. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your mercy for they are from eternity. That is the prayer that is on the heart of so many believers. And then we hear a foreword to Luther's small catechism. Luther made the small catechism to sing the truths of Christian faith in simple question and answer form. That's what the word catechism means. On the surface, Luther's catechism resembles other such works prepared during, before and after the Protestant Reformation, but inwardly it stands in a class by itself. Its uniqueness is best seen in the purpose for which Luther wrote it. He announced his aim at the beginning of each part of the catechism, as the head of the family should teach it in the simplest way to those in the household. This is something that is, is a reminder for us as Christian parents to bring up your children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, Sunday school teachers, vacation Bible school teachers, and pastor are enlisted to help. Thus, Luther wanted his catechism to be more than a teaching instrument in school and to serve a wider audience than children before confirmation age. Luther's small catechism speaks to teenagers, to young adults, to the middle-aged, and the elderly as well. It was made above all to serve the Christian family in the Christian home. It was made for conversation between the God-appointed head of the family and the rest of the household, that father and mother use it to share their Christian faith with their children. Luther intended his catechism to be the Christian's companion for confessing, for praying, and for singing throughout life. Among the distractions of the world, let us use the small catechism as Luther wrote it. Let it find its natural home in our daily life and conversation, at family devotion, and at the bedside. Let us relate its truths to Bible history and to contemporary life. At this time, we're going to have the confirmands come up and take their seats. They're cool to the touch now. They're not hot seats. Good evening. <laughs> I was asked several years ago if I could read the question and hold off naming who should answer the question until the people in the pew have a few seconds to see if they can answer the question themselves. So we're going to proceed in that, in that manner. Explain briefly why Martin Luther is important to us. Greta. Martin Luther is important to us because God used him to uncover the gospel again, and he was bold to preach and teach the gospel through the many threats he received. For what reason did Luther write the small catechism? Colton. He wrote the small catechism to explain in a very condensed form to young adults and to kids how and the teachings of the Bible. What can we know about God from nature? Ben. The complexity and diversity of nature shows that there is an all-powerful, almighty God that created the earth. What can we know about God from our conscience? Hadley. We know, we know from our conscience that God is holy and we are sinful and we deserve punishment. Why is the Bible so valuable to us? Greta. The Bible is valuable to us because it tells us what our nature and conscience can't. That God sent Jesus to save us and that we have eternal, we have eternal life in heaven if we believe. What are the two main teachings of the Bible? Hadley. The two main teachings run through the New Testament, Old Testament, and they are the law and gospel. 
How would you describe them? How would you describe the law and gospel? Ben. The law shows us our sins and our needs for and our need for a savior, and the gospel shows us our savior through Jesus Christ. Please name and define the first use of the law. The first the first use. <laughs> Hadley? The first use of the law is the curb, and the curb is God's threat to punish people who sin and this keeps many from sin. Okay. You you discerned a pattern, didn't you? It's random. It's random. <laughs> <laughs> Please name and define the second use of the law. Colton. The second use of the law is the mirror, which shows us our sins and our need for a savior. Please name and define the third use of the law. Greta. The third use of the law is the guide. The guide is for Christians who are happy to be saved and want to thank God. The Ten Commandments may be divided into two tables. Please describe the relationship each table speaks to. Ben. The first table is commandments one through three, and they show our relationship between us and God. And the second table is commandments four through 10, and they show our relationship between us and our neighbor. We talked about two types of sin. Um, and the question, whether we sin by omission, doing what is forbidden, uh, or failing to do what is, is commanded, I should say, or commission, doing what is forbidden, what do we deserve? Colton. Whether we sin by commission or omission, we deserve eternal death and damnation. Why do we, as Christians, want to keep God's commandments? Ben. We as Christians want to keep God's commandments to show our love and gratitude towards God and to be a good representative of the church. Going into the commandments themselves uh, with these next questions, what place does God want in our lives and why? Greta. God wants him and his will the number one spot in our lives because he is God. He is the source of every blessing and salvation. Looking at the second commandment, what are God-pleasing uses for his name? Hadley. God-pleasing uses for his name are to worship him and praise him and pray for ourselves and others. The third commandment, I mentioned in catechism classes, the one that's the biggest leap for us as New Testament Christians because in the Old Testament time, it, it meant it was practiced by them not doing any work from Friday evening to Saturday evening and for them to be worshiping their Lord then. And, and as Christians, we've got freedom, don't we? And, and we chose as Christians to worship the Lord on Sunday. Uh, tip of the hat to the Father who started creation on the first day of the week, tip of the hat to the Son who rose Easter Sunday morning, a tip of the hat to the Holy Spirit who came on Pentecost Sunday with his gifts. Um, looking at that third commandment, how do we keep the third commandment, Greta? We should value the Bible as God's word and Gladly hear, learn, obey, and believe in private study and public worship. What blessing does God protect through the fourth commandment? Hadley. He wants us to serve and obey um, the authority in our home, in our church, and in the government, and to serve them so God can bless us through them. This is looking at the fifth commandment. Who has the right to end a person's life? Colton. The only people that have the right to end lives are God and those in the government. Looking at the sixth commandment, 
How does God protect marriage according to the sixth commandment? Colton. God protects marriage in the sixth commandment by making it forbidden to cheat on any of your spouses. Spouse. What gift does God protect through the seventh commandment? Brad. God protects the gift of the possessions that we worked hard for and the possessions that he has given us. Looking at the eighth commandment, why is it so important to help our neighbor protect their good name? Hadley. It is important because their reputation can be easily ruined and they need a good reputation to live and work among others. Why do we refer to the ninth and 10th commandments uh, that say you shall not covet? Why do we refer to coveting as a springboard sin? Ben. We refer to coveting as a springboard sin because it can lead to a lot of other sins. We saw examples in scripture Nabal's <coughs> vineyard as a, a prime example, didn't we? Explain what a creed is. Now we're looking at the Apostles' Creed. Explain what a creed is and name the three universal Christian creeds. Colton? A creed is a statement of beliefs, and the three universal creeds are the, are the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athasian Creed. Looking at that first article of the creed, what do we confess in the first article of the Apostles' Creed? Greta. We confess that God the Father made the world in six days of creation, and he continues to protect and preserve it even after the fall into sin, and we owe him our great thanks. What did Jesus have to be to carry out his saving work? This is looking at the second article of the creed, Colton. Jesus had to be true God and true man in order to save all of us from sin. Looking at the third article of the creed, through what does the Holy Spirit come to call us to faith, enlighten us, sanctify us, and keep us in saving faith? Greta? He comes through the means of grace, the gospel and the word and sacrament. Going on to the sacraments, we have the question, what are the three features that describe a sacrament? Hadley? It has to be instituted by Christ. There has to be an earthly element that um, grants us forgiveness of sins and he gives us the sacrament to benefit us. What sacraments or holy acts did God give us? Ben? God gave us the sacrament of holy baptism and the sacrament of holy communion. Okay. Um, what does baptism do for us? Greta. It gives us forgiveness of sins delivers us from death and the devil, and gives us eternal life in heaven if we believe. Shifting to the sacrament of Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper, the question, what blessings are there for those who are properly prepared? Ben. The blessings for those who are properly prepared are forgiveness of sins and eternal life and salvation. We heard, we heard the readings uh, before we began our examination. Uh, what is the result of receiving this meal improperly? Hadley. The result, the result of receiving this meal improperly is you don't believe the body of Christ is there and then you are sinning against the body and blood. <coughs> We talked about how often it was, it was an interesting thing how people latch on to numbers. Luther was asked during the time of the Reformation, how often should we commune? And, and he said, 
I think anybody who doesn't want to commune at least four times a year either doesn't understand how serious their sins are or they don't understand how wonderful the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is. So what did he give as an answer to them? How, how often should we commune? Greta. We should commune as often as it is offered and as often as we are prepared. We studied the ministry of the keys. What is the use of the keys? Colton? There are two keys, the locking and the binding key. The locking key, un, it uh, stops people from it stops people from getting into heaven and says and we say to them that they are unrepented and the unlock unlocking key is for those to say we are they are unrepentant and they are allowed in the church again who has the authority to use the binding and loosing keys greta jesus gave all christians the authority to use them What is confession? We talk about in our worship services, we have confession and absolution. What is confession, Hadley? Confession has two parts. One where we tell our sins, and two where we get forgiveness and absolution from God. And what sins should we confess, Hadley? We should confess all our sins we are guilty of to God, even the ones we don't know. And in front of the pastor, we should confess the sins we know and feel are on us. Okay. Shifting from, shifting from the ministry of the keys uh, and confession, we go to the Lord's Prayer. Explain to us what prayer is. Ben? Prayer is a conversation to God from our heart, either asking him for something, praising him, or giving thanks for something. Why is there only one request for physical blessings in this prayer? We looked at the address, and we looked at seven petitions, and then the doxology, the fitting words at the end. And the rest were for spiritual blessings. Why is there only one request for physical blessings in this prayer? Colton? The reason there is only one request for physical blessings is because spiritual is much, much more important than physical. How do we know that God hears and answers when we pray? Greta. He promised to hear and listen every Christian. And finally, how do you intend to stay in saving faith to life's end? Colton. I intend to say, say, stay in saving faith by going to church and reading my Bible. We thank you for helping the congregation review these teachings again and, and in a practical way you've displayed the fact that you are ready to understand and receive the Lord's Supper to your benefit. You can have a seat. We pray. Heavenly Father, you have gathered people of all ages into the communion of saints. Tonight we thank you especially for the gift of young people to your church. We come before you and ask that you keep them in your care. Protect them from the perils and temptations common to youth. Help them resist the pressure to engage in godless and immoral activity. When they become confused, show them the way. When they hurt, bind up their wounds. When they fail, restore them according to your mercy and keep the cross of Christ before their eyes. Bless them with good friends, competent teachers, faithful pastors, caring parents, 
supportive homes and life-enriching experiences. According to your wisdom, spare them the perils of unexpected tragedy, severe illness, violent crime, a broken home, or an untimely death. Be with our children as they continue to mature. Teach them the value of honest labor and faithful stewardship. Guide and direct them as they prepare for their lives' vocations. Remind them that their highest joy is found in using talents and abilities in service to you. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Most of all, dear Lord, we ask you to keep this and every generation faithful to your truth. Strengthen believers through regular use of word and sacrament. Open our mouths to share the gospel with friends and acquaintances that each new generation may know the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. Amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. <laughs>